I just wanted to welcome everybody to our online salon series presentation. I'm so happy that uh, many of you have signed on tonight to hear from our presenters. My name is Nicole Tange and I'm the manager of the McDowell Foundation. I want to welcome you tonight on behalf of the foundation and our role in the province is to fund teacher-led research such as the projects that you're going to hear about tonight. I would like to start by acknowledging that I'm currently on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of the Cree, Soto, Dene, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis. I appreciate and honor the relationships with one another that allow us to share this land and continue to work towards reconciliation. I know that we have people joining us from other territories, so I hope that you are able to take a minute to consider your own relationship with the land and the people who work, live, and play there. So I'd let, now like to introduce Jessica Brown, president of Saskatoon Teachers Association to bring greetings. Thank you, Nicole. Um, good evening, everyone. So my name is Jessica Brown, and I am the president of the Saskatoon Teachers Association. And I'm really happy to be here with you tonight to congratulate Ivy and Judy on their really exciting research. Um, before I do that, though, I just have to take a moment to share that Ivy, I believe, actually began recently working for the counseling service that shares the building with the STA. And Judy is actually teaching my husband a class at the College of Education right now. So it's a very small world. <laughs> Ivy and Judy, your work has contributed really important insights into our understanding of how teachers might manage the stress of teaching, as well as the added distress of a large scale event like the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm really proud as the president of the STA to bring greetings from Ivy, your local association. And I'm so excited to hear you speak about your research today. I really enjoyed reading the paper and I know that there'll be additional insights coming from you speaking in person. So thank you so much for inviting me and I'm really looking forward to this. Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. Um, I would now like to introduce our moderator for the evening, so Denise Hepner. Denise is an associate director for the Saskatoon, or Saskatoon, sorry, Saskatchewan Teachers Federation Professional Learning. In addition to her role at the STF, Denise is also a McDowell researcher and sits on the board of directors. Welcome, Denise. Thank you. Um, welcome to the research team and our panelists and our participants. Um, yeah, the McDowell Foundation is near and dear to my heart and it has such wonderful, impactful research that has come from our Saskatchewan teachers, which is really exciting. And um, Judy and Ivy, I'm really looking forward to hearing about your research journey and your research re results regarding um, thriving during the pandemic. I I have to admit, I, I didn't necessarily thrive during the pandemic. So I learned a lot through reading your report that that I can apply to my own life. Um, before I turn it over to the researchers, I wanted to quickly go through a few technical things before we get started. To ask questions or make comments, you can use the question and answer feature at the top where you can enter in or vote on questions or comments. Um, we also invite you to use the raise your hand feature to speak where we can turn your mic on if preferred. And we'll be recording tonight's session for those who were unable to attend and we'll have it available on our McDowell website. So we have Jay Salikin from the STF has kindly joined us to offer technical support. Thank you. Technical support is always wonderful. And I would now like to invite the researchers to first introduce themselves and then share their work. And once they're done presenting, um, we'll have some time for questions and conversation after. So welcome, Ivy and Judy. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so to start, um, I'm Ivy Armstrong. I'm a high school uh, school counselor at Marion Graham Collegiate. Um, and I'll let Judy kind of introduce herself as well. Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Judy Furnick, and I'm an educator and mental health practitioner in the province of Saskatchewan. I teach at the University of Saskatchewan and run a private, small private practice doing counseling and coaching and such. Uh, and research is, I guess, the third hat that I wear. And I was super excited to work with Ivy on this project because we share a lot of roles as counselors, educators, researchers. So yeah, take it away, Ivy. 
Yeah, so our agenda today, I'll just talk a little bit about the introduction and how we came to this research project, a little bit about the background, uh, the literature and review, and then we'll go into results, implications, and discussion. Uh, of course, uh, hearing from teachers and those in the education areas um, is a really important part of our work as well, so we do uh, welcome any questions that you might have along the way. So we'll go to the next slide. So basically, when we saw the call out uh, for research from the McDowell Foundation in Wellbeing, um, I actually reached out to Judy. Now, the interesting fact is that Judy and I have only met in person once, and it was actually a coincidental meeting um, because her son goes to the same school that I teach at. Uh, or um, a counselor at. Um, and so actually our friendship um, started online um, through common interests, common people. And so when this came out, I said, okay, I'm working on my master's in social work, looking at self-care and practitioners. And I knew that Judy had done her dissertation working around the human curriculum and very related areas. And so I said, hey, Judy, would you be interested in kind of pursuing this together? Um, think it would be a really cool opportunity here in uh, COVID-19. So the two of us uh, online and virtually using Zoom and other, other ways of communicating, we started to explore ideas of how we might look at COVID-19. And we knew that we wanted to be the hope and to look at the positive perspective, um, what those positive things were that came out of this pandemic. And so we uh, landed on the idea about how did teachers thrive or who did well in the pandemic and what were those qualities? Um, and so part of our exploration was looking at those qualities and maybe are they innate qualities or are they qualities that we can cultivate through um, the way that we educate um, our pre-service teachers, especially with Judy, uh, that's a big interest. Um, but also just the well-being in general. Um, I think well-being of our educational professionals is something that needs to be in the forefront of our discussions right now um, because things have and continue to be really challenging for teachers everywhere, but especially here in Saskatchewan. Um, and so COVID-19 gave us an opportunity to look at things in a different light, and that's where our research came from. So we spent a lot of time looking at that background and really trying to hone in on what would be the most meaningful contribution to research in this area. So when we take a look at the background and literature as we framed this study, we know that teachers are the backbone of schools and society. If we think about it, the majority of people in our society spend 12, 13 years in our education system. And that means that the teachers have a really big influence on our next generation and how our society functions as a whole. And in those uh, positions, teachers are role models and teachers play an important role in demonstrating well-being, but also in enabling well-being in their classroom and with children and youth. And so when teachers thrive, then students can thrive as well. So there's an invested interest in teacher well-being because it actually shows the well-being of our society. And you can see the research by the, uh, the CTF and Gunn and McRae, who looked at the pandemic um, in looking at some of the negative effects. And I think our dialogue as people in society has been, oh, COVID-19 and all of those negative pieces. But we really wanted to counteract that negative and to be able to present some hope in this. And what is it that we can do or what is in our control to make a difference for teachers' well, well-being, to make a difference for our profession? And ultimately, that makes a difference in our society. So we see it's starting with teachers, but it's being much more broad than that. Uh, one of our research participants said this, and I think uh, using their words is a really great way for us to share our research. Um, Judy and I both were in the interviews um, and got a chance um, to do a lot of great collaborative work in conducting the interviews. Um, and there are so many nuggets from our participants. So this is one of them. I think it's all in the way you look at it. Because the pandemic obviously was not great. So the way I looked at it was as a, just another opportunity. So instead of framing it as a negative thing, 
the participant said, hey, this is an opportunity for us and an opportunity to do things differently. So what we did with these six interviews is we put out a request in Saskatoon Public Schools to um, principals to pass it on to folks who maybe they saw as thrivers or to teachers in general. And so we had six teachers self-identify as thrivers and we conducted the interviews virtually over Zoom. Judy and I were both there. Judy took the lead on most of the interviews and I provided support in terms of maybe different perspectives or honing in on what some of the participants had to say. And uh, the two of us really uh, played off of each other really well in terms of getting to the heart of it and really getting that descriptive analysis from them. So we used a descriptive thematic analysis and it was looking at a case study framework guided by narrative inquiry. So we really heard the story of the participants. We heard about their individual situations. And these participants were a variety of roles. So they came from elementary and secondary. We had resource room and special ed teachers, classroom teachers. They all had over 10 years experience and were in their mid to late careers. Some of them were looking forward to retiring soon. Um, but I will say the, the key thing we really noticed with our participants was that there was like an invested passion for teaching and optimism. And so everyone here really went into teaching because they loved the job. And I think that that's an important piece for us to start at looking at what made these teachers unique is that they were really passionate. And uh, Judy is gonna touch on some of the things that we found, some other threads amongst them, but there was really no um, one type of teacher that came to this as a thriver because they did come from a variety of different roles and subjects and experiences. And I think that that uh, demonstrates a rich richness of the data here to say that you don't just need to be a elementary school teacher to find thriving or a secondary teacher or to work with mainstream students or work in a special education classroom. There is really a place for teachers to thrive everywhere. And it's just a matter of finding those qualities and also supporting those qualities in our teachers. So I'm going to pass it to Judy, I think. Thank you, Ivy. And I like that you touch on that. It was um, kind of neat, first of all, that we went into this with a wonder around, would we find any thrivers? And then we had all of these thrivers contact us and they came from such different backgrounds, ages, stages, genders, working in different and unique environments. And it was kind of cool that at first, one of my big questions was, what do these people have in common? And that curiosity um, really guided our inquiry with, or sorry, through all of the interviews. So thanks for that great overview of the um, thematic approach to this, Ivy. So a lot on this slide here, but I'm going to start with this little bubble at the top uh, that sort of speaks to this notion of our wonder around, would we find any thrivers? And we sent out the letters to principals and received uh, a variety of comments back from teachers out there who basically said, you know, I was a thriver. I enjoyed the challenge that uh, COVID-19 presented in the profession. It provided me an opportunity to pivot and look to new directions in teaching. And that just kind of summarizes um, how these teachers embraced um, the pandemic as a challenge, and that was at the root of their ability to thrive. And so uh, in our thematic analysis and in looking at the data, we had some early findings that uh, gave us a through line and a perspective on what all of these teachers brought together in common uh, as thrivers in the profession. So if we look under the early findings side, we had five key findings, and they were uh, number one, adaptability. So all the participants emph emphasized, sorry, uh, the principle of adaptability in a variety of ways. So they were open, um, they were actively seeking out, uh, as I said, challenges, they were curious, they were accepting the possibility of making mistakes and failing and just adapting and pivoting as they needed to. So very much go with the flow um, and be open to that adaptive nature uh, of being human. <laughs> 
The next one was teacher student relationships. And this was not a surprise just in that all of the participants discussed the importance of, you know, building those strong relationships with their students. Another common thread was the, the genuine interest in their students' well-being and their own well-being. Uh, that was a common thread and a, a personal commitment to valuing what their students brought to the classroom, brought to the relationship or connections that were developed in classrooms. And that was a huge support for thriving uh, throughout the pandemic. The third one was fostering community. So this was honoring the notion of community in the classroom, in the school, amongst colleagues, and even in the broader community when they could connect with parents uh, and build those connections as well. And then we had outlook and mindset, uh, two sort of different words to describe that, um, you know, in our observations, the participants had, and I'm going to get to this in a minute, this thriver mindset. They just were open to growth and change, adapting uh, despite the challenge. And then the last finding was, or another key finding, I guess, was teacher and student well-being. So all of the participants emphasized the importance of their well-being and that of their students, and that they had to actively attend to coping and managing and when they were able to do that, they taught that to their students, they listened to what their students' needs were and supported them through the pandemic as well. So from the teacher perspectives, one of the key pieces was that uh, all of the teachers said, you have to be willing to try and fail and then pick up the pieces with whatever happens and you know try and try again. So kind of those um, cliches are those mantras that we hear, but are probably cliche for a reason because they were really the crux of what supported these teachers to get through uh, the pandemic. They also, uh, another key piece was that, you know, we have to not only adopt these features ourselves to support our own thriving, but encourage students to be open-minded as well and to adopt the growth mindset so that they can think about seeing things from different perspectives and not just focus on the difficulty. Another key piece that Ivy touched on as well was that we heard the word I love a lot. So these teachers loved what they do. Um, they loved a challenge that came out quite a bit. And two implications from this were that first of all, thriving, is a mindset that we do have to have a mindset for facing the unknown uh, and that facing adversity can build strength. So that speaks to resilience that I'm gonna talk about in a minute. And then the second key implication is that this is an active process. So navigating the unknown is something that these teachers just jumped into without hesitation. And in doing that, they built strength, they modeled strength, um, and they showed to their students and their colleagues and others, I'm going to share that in a minute as well, that we can heal and grow and repeat that process through adversity as we go. So in addition to speaking to thriving educators, Ivy and I wanted to kind of triangulate our data in the sense that we would get information from these teachers to find out how they were thriving. And Ivy and I would look at the themes coming out of it and come to our own conclusions. But a third piece was bringing in outside sources who knew the teachers and gather information from them as well. So we included in our ethics application um, the ability to reach out to parents or uh, colleagues or administrators and get some knowledge from them about these thriving teachers. And what was cool about that is that what we got from the people who knew our thriving teachers validated and confirmed what we were hearing and seeing from them as well. And this was just that these teachers were master teachers because they were passionate about what they were doing. They were willing to think outside of the box. And as I said, pivot when they needed to, they saw the world as glass half full. Um, and so their peers and colleagues knew that they, that was their personality. Um, they spoke about these teachers as being willing to help uh, others. Um, roll with the punches, you know, make the best out of a difficult situation. They looked for the silver lining and could be positive about situations. Um, 
being present. So we, we saw this from the thriving teachers, as well as those who knew them, they were described or they described themselves as people who could be present in the moment and just problem solve through what they were facing versus getting caught up in the chaos of what was happening in the environments around them, which I think was a really key feature of their um, success as thrivers. And just being able to detach, um, they had the capacity to do self-care. I love that piece, um, which involves setting boundaries, having balance in your life and behaving in ways that you know are good for you. So making sure you have those stop checks uh, and they were lifelong learners and gifted educators. So again, we see all of these pieces of hope and optimism in who these people were. So future directions that came from this work after looking at all of these amazing themes and learning about what these teachers practiced and modeled um, pretty much narrows down to um, the word resilient and that um, you know, one of the, the first recommendations were that teachers who interact with children and youth daily, um, you know, as Ivy spoke to, they are leaders, they shape young minds, and they have to be supported to be resilient, um, either come with some skills of resilience, or build those skills of resilience, be open to building those skills of resilience so that they can uh, foster that in themselves for longevity in the profession and teach that to others. And we also saw that these highly resilient teachers or made the assumption or connection that they stayed in the profession because they were resilient. So resilience is necessary for self and to teach to others. And it serves as a protective factor to keep me healthy and in the profession that hopefully I love. Um, so some conclusions from this, uh, again, we've spoken to a little bit already, but just that resilience can be built and these teachers talked about hardships in life, some of them a great deal of difficulty, things they faced over time that they felt were conducive to building resilience. And so um, an assumption that we're making is that resilience can be built and that there is hope and optimism from this in thinking about how can we influence teacher education, pre-service teacher education or professional development through what I call a human curriculum or the human curriculum um, that has resilience building as a key feature or a foundation of it. And then in summary or in conclusion, I'm, I'm sort of a visual thinker, uh, mind mapper of knowledge and information. And so we kind of looked at all of the things we were seeing. And first of all, at the center, we, Ivy and I knew that there was a thriver mindset. And when in my mind, I think about curriculum because the human curriculum is kind of the heart of my work, I think what would be the outcome of a curriculum? And from this work, we saw that the outcome of a human curriculum would be a thriver mindset, the, the ability to give educators what they need to thrive in the profession as long as they want to. And so the components of the thriver mindset are, first of all, principles of reciprocity, because these teachers not only had skills, but they modeled them and fostered them in others. Um, the key feature of adaptability that in order to thrive, we have to be willing to adapt. We have to be flexible in our thinking and our actions fall flat. If we need to in failure and just pick up the pieces, adapt and move on. Um, and then be community oriented in the sense that we're not just working in our own little bubble of self and student. If we have success in our environment, we share that with our peers and colleagues and we share that with the larger community to support others to be well as well. So that kind of summarizes what we saw as the thriver from the variety of teachers um, and what they had in common was this thriver mindset. And the goal, as I said, moving forward in the future would be to, uh, and I certainly use this to continue to develop coursework for pre-service teachers and help them to hone that thriver mindset. And I know Ivy uh, uses this work in her self-care research and her support for others to develop good quality self-care um, uh, actions that we can use to support ourselves to cope, manage, grow, heal, repeat the process when we face more adversity um, and just carry on through life in healthy uh, ways. Because as leaders, 
uh, our students are looking to us. They're always watching what we're doing. And when we can thrive through adversity, we teach them that they can as well. So that kind of summarizes, I think that's my last slide. Yeah, uh, our presentation component of this. Uh, I just have on this final slide before we get to any questions, if there are any, how to find Ivy and myself. We're both very active, as Ivy mentioned, on social media. So these are our Instagram handles. If you're interested in the work or connecting or chatting, uh, I know both of us are very open to connecting with communities. So thank you very much for listening to us speak on this really exciting project. And uh, I'd love to work with you again, Ivy. I think we generated some great ideas and gathered some interesting people and summarized some cool uh, data from connecting with those people. So thank you very much. Awesome. Well, thank you for this presentation and for sharing the great work that you guys did. Um, we're going to move into the question portion of the evening. If any of our participants have any questions, um, you can put them in the chat or the, the Q&A. I guess while we're waiting for, for those to come in, um, I had some questions. So I, I love that you focused on a more hopeful and strength-based approach. I think that was a really great way to frame this because you're right, there is such um, a negative narrative to around the pandemic. And um, so I was wondering, did you experience any challenges when you decided to focus your project on pandemic thrivers? I don't know who wants to speak to that, but I, I, I really don't think so. Like we put the call out there to principals and we received quite a few emails right off the bat. We kind of filled our quota really quickly and we were like, okay, great. We've got a bunch of teachers. Let's hit the ground running. Um, for me, I think the only challenge early on, which in the end, I think was, um, more of a positive thing was that I was like, what do these people have in common? And I just kept like swimming around in my head, like, because I, I, I kind of anticipated that we'd see right off the bat, ah, this is it. This is why they thrived. But they all had such different stories and different backgrounds that I was getting really curious about that. And maybe that was a bit of a challenge at the start. But I don't know. How about you, Ivy? You know, I think it was interesting because uh, first off, as I mentioned at the beginning, Judy and I had never met in person. And so part of this was actually fostering a relationship in which we could be like vulnerable and share our perspectives on the interviews that we were doing and come together. Um, and so it was like a gift and a challenge at the same time, because we come from different backgrounds, but a lot of similar pieces, but we were getting to know each other really well as we were doing the research. And so it was such an attribute when uh, we would interview people together and they were diverse, but we could, and we had to cut off the conversation between Judy and I so many times after an interview, because we were, we like wanted to talk uh, about all the exciting things that we had heard and how it like related to a different interview that we had done. And so it just created this um, really cool opportunity to to share and like jump off of each other's ideas so it did come from a point of challenge but I think it was actually a really neat experience and how our relationship changed through doing the research um, and just really how two people who have uh, an interest in well-being um, a little bit of a different light in well-being could come together and really um, do some pretty cool work so um, I actually think it was a very enriching experience um, where COVID-19 really gets a bad rap, but maybe there's there's things that we can take from it that are super positive and forward leaning. Um, and I think this is an example of that. Mm -hmm. So um, I worked with teachers and um, actually I, I would consider myself a teacher as well who during the pandemic kind of panicked at first and stumbled it's like oh my goodness how are we going to do this but then 
we had such a great staff that we really connected and then you know we felt supported we faced that adversity we we found our groove and and then i found then i felt that we thrived so um one of your key points is that you know you had a key feature was actively navigating the unknown without hesitation so i'm wondering can late bloomers be considered thrivers yes i'm gonna say yes yeah. And I think you highlight, Denise, something that actually came out in the interview as well uh, that we maybe didn't touch on as much in here is that the environment certainly enabled that. And I mm -hmm. think one of the things that maybe we don't think about is that especially during the beginning parts of the pandemic, we definitely had um, more flexibility, um, you know, in a secondary classroom, for example, maybe not um, having to hit every single outcome or seeing kids every other day or a chance to try things they've never tried before. And so that structure actually allowed teachers to give things a try and to fail and to be more flexible when they weren't worried as much about like contact hours and like some of the curricular pressures and the standardized tests and some of those pieces. So when we gave teachers autonomy um, and the ability, then they thrived. Judy, wow. did you have anything to maybe add to that? I don't actually, I just love that, that component, right? That sometimes there can be such a heavy stress or a pressure that, you know, you let the air out in one area. And then with all that freedom, you're able to just thrive and be uh, creative. And so we definitely saw that in, in these educators. Yeah. They jumped yeah. on it as an opportunity. I, I really feel that, well, with our, in our school division anyways, that, um, the ability to just try things and be innovative and to let some of the things go was really encouraged. So maybe we did kind of let go of some of our, you know, our things that we've always done to try something new. And there was definitely, definitely some positives that came out of it. Yeah. Um, I see a, a question here. It sounds like many of the traits you listed are elements of good teaching practice. Can you share any insight into how the pandemic might have elevated the practice of your participants? Yeah, I know um, several of them spoke to uh, having to learn to use technology in different ways and being kind of forced to use technology in different ways. They tried things that they probably never would have tried before. Um, you know, sending out PowerPoints to students or doing live videos online or just, you know, learning how to use technology in the classroom in a different way once they landed in the space and they couldn't be close to students. So how then did they navigate that? That was one component that stands out. Yeah, I think there was definitely a few participants who really talked about that and talked about how the stuff that they learned during the pandemic, they're still using today. Like even though classrooms have gone back, they've adopted those pieces and they're using them because it is good teaching. And so uh, whoever had shared that question, tons of it is elements of good teaching. But I think there are some teachers who are maybe doing pieces of it or not other pieces of it. And so some of the conversation around the social emotional learning of the students and teachers really walking that out with vulnerability or saying, you know what, I don't know, or um, yeah, we're going through this together. And yes, this uncertainty is here for me as well. I think that human component is something that we maybe don't always see in our classrooms. Maybe because we talk a lot about professional boundaries or we talk about, you know, the role of teachers and learners, but some of those boundaries um, came down in a healthy way, in a way that still respects uh, the roles and responsibilities in the classroom, um, but really demonstrated how you can walk through things in a social emotional way as well. So um, I think for the participants, they certainly did talk about how there was an evolution of their practice um, through the pandemic um, as well. Thank you. There's a question here in the chat. Um, if you could talk to the Ministry of Education or school division leaders about how to support all teachers in thriving through adversity, what key things would you suggest? 
one of my suggestions would be to, uh, I think we really approach mental health and well-being in a very kind of siloed way. And so one of my suggestions would be to invest in, like I said, what I call it, a human curriculum, uh, a place and a space where teachers can learn to honor the pieces of being human that we need to pay attention to, which is a stress, emotions, um, dealing with difficulty and dealing with challenge, maybe diving into some of our own issues and concerns and things that we can look at to help us to be strong and resilient. And then how we can teach that to others and support others. And including that, you know, there are trauma-informed lenses, mental health components, healing-centered and compassion-formed teaching and education. Uh, and I, so I think it's about looking at mental health and well-being in a more wraparound, um, less siloed way, I guess. And I would probably go towards the Ministry of Education and talk about the professionalism and autonomy of teachers and the ability to be flexible and what that looks like and what conditions need to be there for that to happen, um, which I actually think comes from the Ministry of Education. And then I think school division leaders can use parts of maybe mentorship um, professional development opportunities um, where we have people that are supportive across uh, school divisions in the province who can cr um, work in the cr in the area of developing and supporting thriving and well-being um, but also really just acknowledging adversity happens for all of us it's part of being human and so at all times there are teachers that are going through adverse situations um, and so we have have to think about how do we support it when it's happening in our systems what does that look like how do we wrap around but also um what does that mean about teacher well-being and so i think you know self-care is really important but self-care you can't self-care yourself out of really really difficult situations but we can create community care we can create um, situations where teachers feel supported um, and and valued and where well-being um, is a critical factor for both students and teachers and actually i mean all support staff and everyone else in the classroom as well yeah, I really think the heart of it is honoring what it means to be human and that life is hard for everyone. <laughs> and as leaders, I think it's important for us to be vulnerable ourselves and share our difficulties and our challenges and how we overcome them. That human element was something we saw in this work where these teachers with those kind of barriers and the pressure down and just being more open and everybody in struggle shared with their students more openly than they might have previously about their challenges. And that created connection and relationship. And from that, we can learn to thrive as well. So I think um, that vulnerability piece is, is key. We often, like a lot of mental health professional development that I attended as a teacher was very othering in the sense that I'm teaching you about this because you're going to deal with other people who have mental health issues and concerns. And it's like, wait a minute, we all have mental health issues and concerns. And so embracing that human component and then moving through that can help us to thrive. Yeah. So you've talked a bit about the human curriculum and, um, is that something that came out of your your dissertation, Judy? Or where can we find some more information on the, the human curriculum? Yeah, any of it would be attached to, if you Google the human curriculum or my name, you can learn more from my various websites. Uh, it started uh, with my master's and uh, PhD dissertation thesis work, where I just started pulling together components of similar to the work that Ivy and, our, our, and I are, are, have done here um, around what it takes to thrive in difficult situations and looking for key features of that and just discovering that these are all human things. Like if someone wrote a course on how to be human, what would it look like? What would we need as early career teachers to thrive through difficulty or even um, students uh, my, my master's work was on students at risk of school fa failure. And I wouldn't necessarily use that language, but struggling students, what do they need to thrive? What do we need to thrive through a pandemic? Um, and so the themes that I pull out and collate 
you know, through all of my work have to do with um, skills and abilities that we can focus on to be well. And I call them the five M areas. And so they're meaning, mindset, mental health, mentorship, management, and how they're cultivated through four R areas of resilience, uh, resourcefulness, relationship and routines. And so the human curriculum sort of umbrella that I use at the undergraduate graduate level and in my private work, I invite people to think about those themes and think about the challenges they face in life and areas where they have strengths and then areas where they have needs and then teach them ways that they can cultivate, um, uh, I guess, increase strength to be able to, to meet their needs in different ways and just face adversity. So if, you're interested in learning more about it, just Google the work and reach out to me and, um, and then uh, we can go from there. Awesome. So I guess, I guess to kind of um, jump off on that, um, you, in the, in your report, you had mentioned the need for opportunities and resources for teachers to build resilience, such as PD and stress management, mentorship programs, and supportive school cultures. So if, you know, these are big topics, right? And these are some of the things that you're suggesting, recommending that is coming out of your work. Do you have any recommendations for resources for getting started? If if a school division or a school wants to dive into this work and, and look at some of these things, like what, what's a starting place? Mm, good point. <laughs> Do you want to speak to that Ivy or I can certainly give some yeah why don't you start Judy and I'll hop on after yeah sure um you know one if a if a school is into book clubs um a foundational book that I use in my courses is Bruce Perry and Oprah Winfrey's What Happened to You uh, and the reason I like that book is because it resonates with my my um belief that we need to start with the self and look at our own traumas, our own histories, you know, big T, small T trauma, we all define it differently. But the bottom line is we all have hurt and harm. It's part of the human experience. And so resources that help us look at ourselves and gather in community and vulnerably have conversations about that, and then think about how we can take that knowledge to support other people. Um, so that is a foundational text for me. Um, in terms of other resources, there's none coming to the top of my mind, but I do have on my website, my website is just www.drjudyjohnsmansfernick.com, uh, a resources page. And I have all of the books that I've read and loved divided into categories around dealing with grief and loss, dealing with classroom management and practical strategies, supporting stress and anxiety or depression and various mental health um, issues, concerns, behaviors, and such. Um, but I think book clubs, gathering people informally, having conversations, normalizing self-care um, are key. I also think a part of the conversation is talking about the difference between positive psychology and toxic positivity. That's something I talk to groups about, and I don't know how other people define it, but in my mind, um, I see positive psychology as psychological principles that I can learn about and say, hey, that's cool. I can use that in my life. I can um, uh, use the, the ideas or strategies to support myself to be well. And I see toxic positivity as me saying, oh, that works for me. It should and will work for you. And so yeah. I think it's just a difference in how it's presented. Um, but yeah, you know, any resources that support us to connect, learn about ourselves and share that learning from the self to other, uh, I think are good. I, a couple I would add, uh, Burnout, I think by the Nagoski uh, yeah. my, uh, sisters uh, is a good place to start. Uh, it's a pretty easy read. There's a, a workbook that goes with it. Uh, Real self-care is Pooja Lakshman. Um, it says, 
crystals, cleanses, and bubble bath not included. Um, I think when I read it, I was like, this is like my thesis in a book um, where I looked at, you know, bubble baths and wine and, and looking beyond that and how we talk about self-care and wellness. Um, and I think really acknowledging that what I do to be well and what Judy does and what Denise does and what everyone here does looks very different. And it's okay to say, you know what, that doesn't work for me. Um, so part of it is that exploration of how to be well. And obviously boundaries, and there's a couple good books on boundaries, um, are some of the things, but it's also about like shifting perspectives um, on it. You know, I don't need to, you know, my room doesn't have to look meticulous. I don't need to have, you know, all of the bulletin boards done all of the time might be a shift for someone. And so it's looking through perfectionism and people pleasing and some of those things that I think we see in our in private practice and in our work with professionals. Um, it's just a matter of shifting um, what we're doing and how we perceive ourselves. And it is really starting with us. Um, and I don't think anyone goes into teaching thinking I'm going to focus on myself first and that's how I'm going to make a difference. I think we go into teaching because we love working with kids and youth. Um, but the biggest learning I've had in my education and in my experience is that if I don't take care of me first and take care of me before things get tough and before pandemics hit or there's a tragic crisis in my school, if I don't take care of myself before that, I'm certainly going to have much more of a struggle when things get rough. Yeah. Um, and so it's normalizing those conversations and normalizing like go and access your counseling care. You've got lots of benefits for that. Go see a massage therapist, go to the doctor, heck, drink water in the day and go to the bathroom when you have to go to the bathroom. It may seem small, but we yeah. do have to do these things for ourselves while also taking care of our students because they see how we're taking care of ourselves. It shows up because we show up. Yeah. Hmm. Speaking to that, Ivy, you reminded me of a couple other resources. Another great one that I recommend is Kristen Neff's work and Chris Germer, Self-Compassion. Um, you know, what I love about how Kristen Neff frames self-compassion, you know, she's got the mindfulness component and, and other components, but she speaks to a core element of it being common humanity and just understanding that we all have similar things that we struggle with, or we all struggle, we all suffer um, another resource that comes to mind from that is, um, Dan Harris's 10% happier, uh, mindfulness app and podcast. I love how he starts his podcast with, uh, it's, you know, always something to the effect of hello, fellow suffering beings, just normalizing that we come to this experience of being human as a common experience. And so, uh, anything that helps us understand that and work on self-compassion, self-work, self-growth, uh, is a great place to start. And I think that we also need to not make it complicated or adding another thing onto a to-do list. So I think about self-care in five minute, 10 minute, you know, 15 minutes. So making a list of those things to an hour, we don't have to take a day and get a manicure and a massage and all of these things. We literally could take five minutes and have a cup of tea and be very mindful in that moment. And that will create well-being. It could be, um, you know, I have a Fitbit and I'll set the calm thing and I'll go to the bathroom and go through one set of breathing exercises. And so in this day where we keep adding on to teachers to do lists over and over again, and now we're saying, hey, you are responsible for your well-being. I think we take a step back and saying we're responsible for our community's well-being. There's ways that we can influence that by doing small things. We don't have to make them big things. Um, but ultimately, uh, we can't self-care ourselves out of a broken system either. So mm -hmm. acknowledging what we can do and what we can't do and not place this solely on teachers, because I think that that's an easy way that we can say, oh, well, if teachers just self-cared some more, then you'd be okay. But it is bigger than that. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, I, I think that came out um, in your report as well. You, you know, you have you, the participants were saying, I can't control change, but I can control how I react to it. Um, it's all in the way you look at it. And one thing that I found really um, 
that you kind of pulled out as a practical thing that I took away was your naming and reframing conversation. You know about cognitive reframing, it changes our thoughts, which changes our actions, which changes our emotions, and um, how we really need to be open to that and really embrace that and how we can do, because we are right, we can't change, there are a lot of things that we can't change in education, but there are those things that we can, and it's so hard as, it's so hard, the self-care piece, it's just, yeah, as educators, it's, it's not something that. You're right. We didn't get into this to uh, for self care. Yeah, and that's one of the places I start when I'm consulting or supporting educators or leaders. Is okay. Let's make the list of what is within my sphere of influence or in my control, and what's not within my sphere of influence or in my control. And then let's just separate those two and focus on what we can control. And that starts with the self. Uh, and we did see a lot of teachers or thrivers CBT in themselves, like cognitive behavioral therapy and reframing and saying even DBT in the sense that, okay, I can have two things at once. This can be extremely hard and it can be an opportunity. And so, yeah, I like that you were able to pick up on that, Denise, and, and have that takeaway as well. And make sure I'm not missing any questions because I'm as asking them all. Okay, no. So I'm wondering, so Ivy, I was wondering in your role as um, student support counselor, right? Is that right? Yes. Yeah, do you counselor. ever, do you ever get a chance to talk to teachers about this aspect that came out of your work? Are you going to be able to share it in your role so that you, you can support the teachers in that way as well? I think it it often comes up. Um, you know, we have lots of conversations with teachers about students, and sometimes teachers come to us about other things that are going on, or um, you know, it comes out in our conversations. So I think it's just the nature of who I am that I'm always will always put that little piece in because uh, teachers do need to be well and to say, you know what, it's okay to take a sick day when you when you're sick, you know, or here's your permission. You know, I'll grant permission, not because they need my permission, but sometimes when someone else says, hey, this is something that you can do, um, they're more likely to to do it. Um, I know that I've found that in my life when people are, you have permission to say no. And I was like, I do. I do. <laughs> so, yeah, I have those one on one conversations with teachers along the way. Um, and I, I think there's always ways that we can be um peer influence in situations. And so lots of people know about uh, what I was working on my my master's thesis I defended in June um, and some of the work around that, or they come into my office and see the books in there. And then we have a conversation starting with, hey, what did you think of this book? Um, and so the conversations happen in a variety of different ways, but I think that there's there's so much we can do to influence from the inside um, mm -hmm. in our peer groups and to just be a support and an advocate for teachers. Awesome. I guess I guess my last question is, if there's not other questions here, I'm just checking is, um, so I, I love that you focused on the positive and, and you know pulled out is pulled out ideas where you were aiming to infuse hope and I'm wondering did did you guys resonate as thrivers before this started or is that did it come from your thrivership is that a word <laughs> you want to go first Ivy or do you sure <laughs> I think it's a complicated question uh, for me in particular because I actually changed schools and roles in the middle of the pandemic. And so I was adopting to a lot of change um, beyond just the pandemic changes we were having, but getting to new to know a new school building and people mm -hmm. there. And so I think um, the research certainly comes out of some personal experience. I don't think you become a self 
self-care researcher and interested on well-being if you've always been amazing at self-care and being well. Uh, so I think certainly through the challenges that you experience, um, it kind of brings you to a place of wanting to dive in more. And so I don't know if I would have classified myself as a thriver maybe in the time period of our research study, but I would say now I'm certainly in that thriving component um, because I do think I have and continue to adopt a lot of the things in our study. And I think I did before as well. And kind of roll with the punches being that steadfast person um, but certainly with times of trouble and times of stress and struggle and so I don't know in that period but I think now I would classify myself as a thriver yeah yeah and I think it's that it's that long-term perspective on thriving like it's not like you know I think when the pandemic hit um, it was scary. I ride with a lot of anxiety as it is. And, and then having to pivot to teaching online, um, to providing my service completely through a computer created a lot of anxiety for me and fear. Um, but then I started to learn about myself and I was like, Oh, I always thought I was an extrovert. And now I'm learning. I'm a little bit of an introvert and I'm learning how much time alone I can handle. And like, you're riding these waves. And then as you come away from it, you know, you're, you're, reflecting back and realizing, you know, I was open to learning and I was flexible and it was really hard, but, um, and so it's that, that long-term perspective on things. And I think that's important to remember. We can get so caught up in the moment of like seesawing through life that we don't realize that, you know, when time passes, we'll probably come out of it. Okay. Or we'll maybe have learned some skills and just being open to, to that possibility. So yeah, that is a complicated question. And there were times it, uh, right in the pandemic where I said, would say, no, I am not thriving. I am suffering. <laughs> I'm suffering big time. <laughs> um, but I was able to ride those waves. And, and then when we came to this work and, and looking back and talking to others, just gaining more understanding of what helps us to do that and realizing, okay, these were weaknesses of mine. These are things I want to work more on. And these were strengths. And these are things that I want to continue to share with others that can be strengths in times of stress too, so. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I don't think I would have been able to answer your call for pandemic thrivers when you put that, I wasn't in SAS Public, I was in a different school division, but um, something that comes out of your research is that, right, we can develop this, right? And it's through working through adversity and through that openness and effort and awareness and a desire and community that we can we can work through it and when we work through that adversity you're building the skills so like you said that more long-term um approach and I just yeah it's I think we we've all learned something through the pandemic we've all um Definitely, there's been some ups and downs, and I really, I really resonate with your roller coaster analogy. But um, yeah, I, I feel like it. A lot of this has come through in your work, and how we can develop that um, resilience and that growth mindset, and that we can become thrivers, and and maybe we are because we've all made it through, and um, we can look back and see all of the things that we have learned by coming through the adversity within, within everything that's happened. So. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's hard in the moment to like, obviously I've been through a lot of adversity. And if someone was to say to me, Oh, this is a lesson, <laughs> look for the positive. What are you learning? No. You know, shut up. this is impossible. Leave me alone. Um, but really when we worked with these teachers, I don't know if you remember this Ivy, but like so many of them had such extreme adversity that they had faced in their life. Like I walked away from a lot of our interviews, which ended up being quite intimate thinking, wow, this person has faced a lot of hardship, um, and difficulty. And you really saw in the end that each of those things, these people faced and conquered or coped with or managed with built an extra layer of armor that protected them for the next thing or helped them through the next thing. And so, you know, it, it is in retrospect, if we can look back and say that really hard thing taught me something, gave me a layer of protection. And then when I take that into the next hard thing I face, I can maybe remind myself that, you know, I can do this. 
uh, it will teach me something, or maybe I'll learn something that I can carry forward and help myself or help someone else with it. It's like, I, I came through that. I can get through this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. There's a message in a ch in the chat. It says, um, such a great message. How can non-thrivers learn about messages that you have found within the education system? Good question. Go ahead. I think seek out the people that you see thriving. Yeah. And even though it's like on the outside, um, you know, they're doing something, something right. So I think sometimes, uh, you know, just not noticing where those people who seem to be doing really well and listen and listen yeah. a lot and get really curious um, and then be really self-compassionate. If you're saying, hey, I'm a non-thriver, you know, look at it with curiosity and say, you know what, I'm just going to be open to a new idea or a new way of being, but I'm also not going to, you know, feel guilty or shame that I'm not thriving right now, but really just be open to a different way and to listen and learn. Yeah, that's a great answer. Mm -hmm. and, and ask for help, as you had mentioned in your report as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. that community piece was is huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Thanks, Lily. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, if we can do anything to destigmatize asking for help, you know, I'm a huge, obviously huge proponent of therapy as a therapist, but I seek my own therapy often um, and seek guidance and advice from people because no one can do it alone. We weren't meant to do it alone. We didn't thrive as a human race or species alone. We did it in community and with help. So uh, we need to help each other and be open to seeking help from others. And mm -hmm. I think part of that normalizing, I like to talk about going to counseling is like going and getting your teeth cleaned uh, or going when your teeth are hurting. So we do it as preventative. We do it um, when times are tough, but we also do it when times are good to get different perspectives. And so part of it is just really ado adopting that growth mindset and adopting the mindset that we aren't super, teachers are not superheroes. Teachers are human and we um, are important and worthy as well. And so we are worthy of taking care, taking care of and being well. And, um, and that's part of, yeah, being human. I think that's what it comes down to. So uh, what does it mean to be human? Well, it's to ask for help, to be in community um, and to do all of those pieces. Yeah. And when you think about the 12 stages of burnout, one of the first, you know, signals is that hero mentality. Like I'm going to do it all and I'm going to, you know, work super hard. Um, and, and that's like the first step on that path to burnout. And so at some point we have to interject and be like, wait a minute, I'm not a hero. I can't do it all. I can't save the world. I'm just going to save myself, <laughs> go and see a therapist, get some support. Um, so just shifting that, that mindset yeah, is, is hugely important. And on the topic of therapy, you know, sometimes I know when I first started trialing therapy myself, uh, for myself, I met a couple therapists that I didn't jive with. And then that turned me off of therapy for a little while. So if you're giving it a try and you meet someone just like any other relationship in life, you're going to find people where you align and people where you don't, don't give up on the first or second therapist. If it's not working, you know, seek out someone that you really connect with and trust and can build a good relationship with and be vulnerable with and, and then stick with it. And I feel like my therapist is like a BFF with degrees who can give me great perspective. And like Ivy said, I go and hang out when things are okay. And I just need perspective. And then I have them there when I have a crisis and, you know, I've hit rock bottom and I'm, you know, the relationship is made. So that's great advice. Um, how did the research you did change or enrich you personally? Question from Lily. I think it was affirming uh, in some way. Um, and I think it really um, instilled what I believe about teachers and about human beings is that, um, you know, there's that hope that uh, we can influence uh, people in the future. 
and also that people are doing the best job they can with what they have in the moment. And so um, I think that it really just affirmed to me the goodness and the hope that I have for this profession, um, because very much like uh, the participants, I came into education because I wanted to help people and because I really like working with teenagers. And so um, that hope that there's other people out there that are thriving while doing all of this incredible work. And if you saw the comments, as Judy read at one point, their colleagues saw the amazing work that they were doing too. And so all of those things can coexist. Mm -hmm. Um but there was also the component of realizing um, that everyone got to it in a little bit of a different way and that through adversity, they often found those thriving characteristics. Yeah. Yeah, that resonates with me too. I found it very validating. Um, you know, we we hear these things all the time that, you know, the the key to our happiness the key to thriving, it's relationship, it's connection, it's community, but it really, really is right. Like there's no magic sauce. There's no program or process out there that if I follow all the steps, I'm going to find the path to happiness. It really truly is in connection and collaboration with others. And for me, just doing, diving into this work and realizing that was an aha moment, uh, and is just affirming in the sense that, you know, I'm going to carry on and continue to teach that, that, if we're struggling, just keep coming back to relationship and connection it, with someone, somewhere, somehow you will find um, the path that helps you reach hopefully that, that thriving sense, that flourishing sense. Thank you. If there's no other questions, I'm going to turn it back over to Nicole. Okay, well, hopefully, if I mean, if any last minute questions come in, I'll, I'll just refer back to them. But uh, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us tonight and taking the time out of your day to sit here and um, learn about this awesome project. Uh, the mission of the McDowell Foundation is enriching teaching and learning by supporting professionally led research, supporting teachers such as these here tonight to ask the questions about themselves, their schools and their profession. And that's why we're here. We are pleased to have been able to provide the space for these conversations and hope that they continue into staff rooms, coffee shops, boardrooms and all places where decisions around education are occurring. Thank you to Ivy and Judy for sharing your knowledge and experience. And thank you, Denise, for your support and leadership tonight as moderator. And of course, thank you to Jay for making sure that everything all happened here. The foundation exists because we believe in the professionalism of teachers and the need to ensure that good research comes from all of us, not from external places and spaces. Thank you to our many donors, including the Saskatchewan Teachers Federation, that allows us to ensure teacher voice and teacher experience continue to lead this conversation. For more information about this project or any other project or to donate to the foundation, please visit our website, which I'll put in the chat. And thank you and have a very nice night.